Good afternoon. We're here with Professor Aminal Dean and Critical Talk. And I am so fortunate to have with me this early evening, Alex Cronemer, who is the co-founder of the award-winning, and it is indeed, film company, Unity Productions, who works in the media to create a better understanding of Muslims and Islam. UPF films have been translated into several languages and have been seen by over 200 million people worldwide. And they have used the, their understanding, which I think is unique, of interfaith, peace building, reconciliation efforts to put films that all of us have enjoyed. And I can say that my classes have enjoyed and I've used forever. Uh, their current project is an animated film, uh, which we'll see a little bit of later. But first, I want to welcome you, Alex. Haven't Thanks. seen you for a minute. I <laughs> know it's been a while. It <laughs> has. It Thanks has. for having me on. It, well, this has been wonderful. I, I have loads of questions. And I'm going to try to tailor them. Okay. to certain areas. Why Unity Productions? What made you all come up with it? You co-founded it with Michael Wolf. What made you or forced you or incited you to yeah. do Unity Productions? Well, you know, I met Michael on an airplane ride uh, from Saudi Arabia. We were both in Saudi doing different things. I was uh, with a, a group of uh, professors, uh, doing a tour of the, the Muslim world. Yeah. And uh, Michael was uh, uh, speaking at a conference and we wound up on this same flight back to the United States. Mm -hmm. And as we were, you know, just who are you? What do you do? We, we both realized that um, uh, we were working in, in our own capacities to try to create a better understanding about Muslims and Islam, of which there was 20 years ago, as today, but hopefully somewhat improving today. But you know, so much misunderstanding, uh, so many negative stereotypes, so so mm -hmm. much uh, division uh, mm -hmm. that those ideas caused. And and we recognize that the the most powerful uh, uh, thing that created these misunderstandings, these stereotypes, was television and movies, right. which portrayed right. Muslims often in such negative ways. And so we felt that the best way to address that was also through the media, through television and films and movies. Uh, and so we found the Unity Productions Foundation to make that, to make films. How does one found a foundation to do TV and film? Well, it's a, not a, it's a little tricky, to be honest with you. Okay. I mean, uh, when, we, when we first began, we didn't really know um, how we were going to go about doing this. We decided to make it a nonprofit rather than a for-profit organization, uh, okay. because we really wanted, you know, we, we really were embracing an educational mission. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that really was a central thing of what we were trying to do. So we, okay. Okay. The foundation, we went through all the, the various uh, hoops you have to go through to uh, be designated as a nonprofit, and we were not designated 501c3 nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, we're pretty unique because there's probably maybe a half dozen other organizations that are in the media space that are nonprofit. You know, the media is a, uh, generates a lot of money. And so most people. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, movies and television um, uh, account for more dollars spent in the economy than is spent on food production and consumption. So think of that just for a second. Are you serious? Yeah. Yes. Huh? It's, uh, it's, actually, it's actually amazing. We spend more on entertainment than we do on producing and consuming food. So. Our spiritual consumption, you might say, is, is huge. So it's, it's a big business, you know, a trillion dollar, you know, sort of business. But we, again, want to occupy a nonprofit place in that, which is what we've done up until this point. Uh, you know, so all of our films, uh, we've had some theatrical releases, but generally they, they go to public television, PBS, and then on to various educational outlets. And as you said in the introduction, uh, they're used widely for interfaith, peace building, uh, uh, conflict re resolution and, and uh, uh, reconciliation efforts around okay. the world. Let me back you up a little. But you got to have some money. Yes. How does one raise the money for yeah. a TV show? 
Yeah, uh, good question. So, um, I mean, the way the I mean, typically you raise you either have a uh, again a, a network television that pays for a show, or you find investors if it's for a movie. In our case, uh, we have gone through gone to numerous uh, uh, foundations uh, okay. that have given us money over the years. Think places like. Um, uh, the Carnegie Corporation, the Corporation right. of Public Broadcasting, okay. many, many, many others. Other sources are individuals. We we um, uh, solicit money from individual folks. We have probably in in the twenty years that we've been in business, we probably had maybe twenty thousand uh, different individual individuals who have donated money, and then uh, family foundations as well. So those are kind of the three major. Mm -hmm. areas where we money. There's some. Uh, return from the selling of the films, which goes back to since we're not a profit, all, any prof, profits go back to the company, uh, and so that also makes up some portion of our budgets. So you see now that we're live streaming to Facebook and hopefully YouTube and wherever else things go, which is very different than when you started. Uh, also, and we'll get into that in a hot minute. The making of movies is different. Yeah. You're in entertaining animation. Um, I mean, everything is changing. So I'm wondering how do you guys keep up? Keep up? And then I want to quickly go to idea production. Yeah. Well, you know, um, the barriers of entry uh, to this, to, to filmmaking, to, to putting out content, of course, has almost disappeared. When I first started, when we made our first project, mm -hmm. uh, the, the barriers of entry were, were, were very high because the cost of creating film, I mean, this is pre-cell phones, pre-digital. We, we Our first film, Muhammad Legacy, was done in the old-fashioned analog way. And okay. uh, that... You want to explain what analog yeah, is? So analog was back in the days when you would take actual film, each canister held about 10 minutes of film, you would shoot on a canister. You would then have to take that, uh, handle that in a special way. It would have to be developed and so forth. It was very uh, laborious, time consuming, and every 10 minutes of film cost about $20,000. Just to process the film, just to take care of it. It was okay. very, every 10 minutes, it, about, you know, it was about, uh, uh, you know, $200 per minute. That's what it cost to do that. Very, oh my goodness. Yeah, very expensive. Yeah, so, yeah. So the barriers were, you know, you have that you had to have a lot of money going into this, you know. Whereas now with digital production, uh, that cost is one tenth. You're even doing good okay, but explain the what does digital production look like? Yeah, so digital production is so instead of having that canister, you know, every 10 minutes you got to change it and, and handle it in very special ways. That canister, you mean that round thing of film? That, exactly. So that old, oh, old, old okay. picture you would see. Okay, old, okay, okay, okay. You have to take that, you have to uh -huh. put it into a, a, a black bag, open it up so no light could get in, get the film up, put in right. new film, you know, and then that film had to be kept at a certain temperature. It was very laborious. Well, now, of course, uh, all we do is we have a literally a little thumb drive. We stick a thumb drive into a camera. We can shoot for hours and hours and hours. And then you take out right. that thumb drive, you download it into your computer, and there's all your material ready to edit. It doesn't have to be treated. It doesn't have to be developed. It's right there. That evening, you can begin editing your film. And of course, with these little devices right now, everybody is a filmmaker, right? Everyone can shoot video. Yeah. And edit. Not good film all the time. And but yeah. on YouTube or whatever and have, you know, immediate audiences. So there's no... Uh, but you, you, you were raising a question about ideas and story making. So, one of the one of the virtues, you might say, of those barriers were only the best ideas ever got out Made there. It they were so expensive. Now we suffer from, uh, you know, so many, uh, so much content that it's overwhelming, and much of that content isn't good. It's misleading, and some of it is uh, actually harmful. Uh, so yeah. uh, that's that's uh, that's the challenge of our time right now. Is is the fact that there are no, um, there are there is nobody who is uh, putting up. Uh, there's no gatekeepers anymore. Uh, who can yeah, because there used to be ratings for yeah. actual movies, but there's no rating online. Okay, so and in want, the digital world. So since the digital world, uh, you want to hear a, a mind blowing statistic? All right. Okay. So so before 1900, 
right? The amount of knowledge that existed in the world, right? Doubled every 500 years. So starting, you know, year one till 1900, every 500 years, knowledge doubled, right? Then beginning in 1900, knowledge began doubling every 50 years or so. Today, today, knowledge, the amount of knowledge that exists doubles every eight days. Just think about That's that. That's why I can't keep up. You every, know, I needed to, I needed to know why. Now, you know, now, <laughs> now, now I know why. So, you know, it's impossible to keep up. You know, it's, 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 it's so, as I say, we suffer now from so much content that it's hard to find good content, accurate. It is, content. it is, excellent. So when you are thinking, how, how, you know, I don't know if you all still do storyboards or, um, I learned about the storyboards the hard way. And then I learned very quickly that I couldn't make one, but, um, do you still do storyboards? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, so when you're, you know, the when people think of filmmaking and filming, they mm -hmm. generally think of, you know, lights, camera, action. You think of the camera, the cameraman, actors running. Yeah, around. yeah. But a film project typically takes about eighteen months from the minute you press go to the minute you finish. Eighteen months, right? In that eighteen months, maybe three weeks, maybe four weeks is the filming. The rest of it is at the back end. There's a few months of what they call post production, which is the editing, but mm -hmm. most of it is upfront. <laughs> is the is what happens in the planning? Because if you think about it, think about any movie you've ever seen, right? Any movie. Okay. Every single the, the camera goes into the room. Everything that's in that room. Somebody had to think. What does this room look like? What's going to be in this room? What's the characters going to be wearing? You know. What, what's the lighting? What's the angles? What time? And you know, you have to think through all that stuff. It takes very careful planning. And so, yes, you storyboard it. You write very detailed notes. Uh, scripts uh, get you know taken apart and and handed out to different like art departments and costuming departments and makeup departments. All of them contribute to figuring out. Yeah, and that's what I'm going to talk to you yeah. about in a little bit. But how have you decided what? to do that is really the biggest challenge of this work because right now you and i uh sat down right now we said if if we wanted to get a movie on television tomorrow or mm -hmm. a movie in the theaters tomorrow we could think of a dozen ideas that would be instant hits because right we know what the audience cares about right now today right 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 but when you go to and this is true for anybody making a movie uh of any kind you know from the time that you actually begin to the time it airs it's like a three years so you're really trying to anticipate what an audience is going to care about three years from now. Oh, okay, okay. How many films actually flop? Because it isn't, it's just that their timing, you know, it's not their fault. And they made the best movie they thought. But by the time the movie came out, audiences were tired of that topic. Or they were tired of those jokes. Or, you know, they there was another burning issue that, that, that um, was capturing people's imaginations. And that's the movie that people wanted to see. So that's the trick, is to really try to, Imagine, you know, to, to be enough in touch with where we are right now to have a feeling for what audiences will want two, three, four years from now. So, take for example, right now. Right now, we have a, well, we're still in a pandemic. Yeah. A very confusing one because she won't just come in and then leave. She's got to linger and then there's thoughts about her coming back and people are confused about whether I go or stay. They stuck a toe out the door and there was a protest. Yeah. Then there was uh, defund the police. So that's my idea. What yeah. do I do with it? Well, Alex, I want you all to think about how, because the, the mission of you, I don't know why I can't get it, UPF. That's right. Is to think about reconciliation, peacemaking, but it's also to make us contemplate what's going on. 
Yeah. We want to talk about Muslims in interaction, sometimes about Muslims, period. Uh, but now I want us to talk about us and our thoughts about what's going on now. Right. How do I make a movie? Well, at that... Okay, so... Um, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you that. You didn't. I didn't know <laughs> for our uh, film here. <laughs> uh -huh. Now, and it's, and it's live, you know, we're on the spot. Well, look, yeah. here's, here's the thing. Here's the challenge. Um, there are a lot of great concepts out there. You've actually just mentioned a few concepts. You're like, you know, a, a pandemic, uh, the, 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 the protest, uh, you know, striving for racial justice, Right. All of these things, these are, these are ideas or concepts. Right. What's required is a story. What is the story? Who, who are, what's happening to particular people in this space that an audience is going to want to spend money, spend time going through it with them, right? So, so that mm -hmm. is always the hardest part of it all is coming up with that story. So uh, since you think about religious things. Yeah. I could talk about the fact that the Catholic Church shuts down. The Christian churches have to shut down. And oh my goodness, the Muslims are in Ramadan in the middle of the pandemic. Right. 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 Well, there you go. So so that so that's that's beginning to move towards the story. So we're we're saying okay, uh, so maybe we're going to look at in, in this hypothetical example, maybe we're going to look at uh, the the struggles of uh, of a of a uh, Muslim imam, a Catholic priest, yeah, uh, a yeah. Jewish rabbi, and 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 how their lives may be intersecting, and maybe we have a story where they're suspicious and divided of one another, but how COVID makes them yeah. happy together, yeah. or or the opposite. I mean, it can also be a story of tragedy. It can be a story of how how this period rips people apart. Uh, how it how it devastates lives. You know, this is what I'm trying to say. What is your story? And oh, what, will audience, story. What, what will an audience like? So in this case, and this is what I'm talking about, anticipating three years from now, three years from now, who knows how long this COVID thing is going to go on and mm -hmm. what and what it's how it's finally going to end. So three years from now, will people even want to watch a movie about COVID? And if they do, will they want a movie that's hard hitting and tragic or will they want some comedy even coming out of it? I, you know, that's something that you have to. I really like that. I like that. Yeah, so yeah, so I could do a historical thing about, and, and as a front piece about what pandemics have wrought. Yes. Did they bring people closer together or not? Uh, there's been a humongous number of interreligious dialogue pieces during this, and it can be about how we should keep that going. Yep. Post pandemic. Okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. Well, I'm I'm, I'm gonna look forward going to the Academy Awards with you. Yes. Now. Yes. <laughs> okay, I want to talk about uh, the Sultan and the, no, yeah, the Sultan and the Saint. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask them to cue that up because I got we've talked about quite a few things, but all of them are encapsulated in this trailer. Mm -hmm. So can I get you all to cue that up for me, please? It is the height, we say. Muslims and Christians have been fighting one another in a war that has raged 120 years. Turn it up a little bit. St. Francis of Assisi and the Sultan of Egypt, Mohammed al Kamil, nephew of the famous Salah Adin, defy their angry times and human nature itself to cross the bloody battle lines and meet in peace. But will it make a difference? How does anyone stop the violence in a seemingly endless conflict? <laughs> more than just our daily struggles. Where there is darkness, light, 
where there is sadness, joy. The Lord has made us for a greater purpose, to be instruments of his peace. When Al Kamal comes to the throne, he's in a rather precarious position. These two were indeed seeking peace in the midst of war, so they were open to being transformed by the person who was allegedly their enemy. Now, needless to say, I have 5,000 questions. First, how do you choose a casting director? Mm, good question. Um, um, well, I mean, a casting director is as good as their, um, their clientele. In other words, casting directors represent various actors. Uh, and so you're pulling from that pool of actors. Uh, there are there are there are huge companies and there are smaller ones. Um, so we chose one. The film that we made, by the way, everything you saw, uh, the castle, uh, you know, the streets of Assisi, all that that was entirely filmed in Baltimore. We created sets uh, for all those scenes. So we wanted to make it a local. We're, I'm in the Baltimore area. We wanted to make it a local production. So we worked with a local casting director, and all the talent uh, um, in the film was drawn really in the. Mm -hmm. Tri-state area of Maryland, and so you got people to put on turbans yeah. and get dirty and look like they have been fighting, and they ran down the street with uh, torches. Yeah, well, get out of here. Well, the best part, best part about that is, um, you know, there's a lot of reenactors. In it, I mean, I'm, I'm sure around the country, but in this area, particular, there's a lot of people who reenact. Uh, Renaissance period, and they have. Yeah, like, we just put out a call. We got for our big battle. We have a big battle scene in the film. We had like 300 people show up, all with their armor, <laughs> and everything ready to go. And so we it had this. Ready to go. Yeah, we'd had this huge uh, battle scene. We were able to stage because we had all the actors uh, really come to us. So. So how how does a script get written? Yeah. So the Sultan is saying, I wrote that script. That, that, that was a script uh, that went through 40 revisions, uh, literally 40, 40 revisions. Uh, so again, you know, you, you know, you're, you're coming up with a story and, and, mm -hmm. and you, and you trying to figure out what the story is and what the characters are. And you, you, you write a, a draft of that and then you go back and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with a, I'm sure you know him, the, the calligrapher Muhammad Zakaria. I do, is he still around? He is still around. Oh, yeah. my goodness. I got to call him. Okay, oh, you're, go, you're, ahead. You're, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. But, but I remember he once told me about his artistic process. He said he would he would make a piece of calligraphy and he'd put it in a drawer. And then he'd take it out a few days later and his expression, and it would laugh at him, meaning he would see all its flaws. And then he would mm -hmm. write, work on it and he'd put it away again and he'd pull it out another few days and it would laugh at him again. And he would go through this process until finally when he pulled it out, he didn't laugh at him anymore. You know, it was getting to be good. And that's kind of the, that's the script writing. You write it and you go back and all oh, this dialogue's very wooden. The scene suddenly doesn't seem very believable or you realize there needs to be another scene in here. You, you work on that. And you just keep going back and forth over and over again. At some point, um, at least in my process, I, I, I let the script go out to the world. I, I have numerous people read it. I give feedback, commentary, criticism. Uh, and, and I try to, you know, digest that and 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 use that to improve the product and until it finally gets to a point where it's not laughing anymore you know it's it's like yeah, yeah. It's serious. and then that's when you know you're kind of ready so the part where the man holds up his hand and there's blood on it is yeah. that in the script or is that something added after the script yeah that's in the script yeah that's in the script so i mean what's happening in that scene is um um that particular character is one of the people who was to become a follower of Francis. And we're trying, we were trying to show that when Francis was coming uh, into great influence, mm -hmm. the people of the time were getting sick of war. There was a lot of mm. war. And so that character is meant to be kind of like a, somebody who's suffering from PSTD. He's been in the mm -hmm. war in the battle, and that blood is not real. He's imagining it. He's sort of, you know, he's given a couple mm -hmm. of lines and he sees it and he's like staring at it. And he hears Francis preaching outside and when he looks again, his hand, the blood isn't there anymore. 
So it's kind of like to try to we were trying to demonstrate the psychological uh, impact that Francis' teachers were having on him, this young man who had been knowing nothing but war, and now he ends up following him. Well, let's, let's was, talk for a hot minute. Who is Francis of Assisi? Yeah, so Francis of Assisi, he, he lived uh, in, in, 12, in the year 1200. Uh, he was uh, uh, a friar, which was a, sort of a, a monk in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and he ended up at a time when the Catholic Church was very, um, uh, you know, was fighting crusades, not just against Muslims mm -hmm. and Jews, but against other Christians. Right. Uh, it, was a, it, was, it was a period of, of a very warlike uh, mm -hmm. period in, in, in Catholic history. This was the person who said, this is not the teachings of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. the teachings of Jesus Christ are peace. And so he kind of did a number of things in that direction, including, and that's what our story's about, he went to Egypt where the Crusades were being actively fought. And he crossed the battle lines and he met with the Sultan of Egypt uh, mm -hmm. who tried to, you know, try to arrive at some way of, of a peaceful interaction. And everyone expected the Sultan of Egypt to kill him, you know, uh, but he didn't. And in fact, not only did he not kill Francis, he treated him very well. Mm -hmm. uh, Francis went back. There were still fighting and, and, and battles that went on, but then the Sultan had this very uh, uh, extreme act of mercy when he had the crusading army finally surrounded some 20,000, 30,000 men, easily could have let them die. He, he let them go back to Europe. And these right. men kind of carried this news that, hey, Muslims aren't so bad. I mean, look at yeah. the for us. And that really is what started the ending of the Crusades. It was, right. it was suddenly kind of like this, um, uh, this news that got out that made that made people feel less um, eager to go off to yeah. and mm -hmm. fight the you know infidel and and so it all kind of started with Francis making that journey so that's what this that particular movie is about and by what the way I, I don't like to uh, brag here but it was not that film was nominated for an Emmy award so it, it's a very I good know I was over here <laughs> clapping because it is so real. You know, and the most people have gotten prior to that is what was that Robin Hood? Yeah. yeah. You know, and you get a back snap shot of the Crusades. Well, well, I'll tell you one little thing about Robin Hood. Um, mm. Our costumes, uh, we, we, we got many of our costumes from movie movies. One of them was Robin Hood mm. uh, and the Gladiator. So a number of our costumes came from those movies. You're kidding. Oh. Yeah, so we... We had a big giant uh, 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 truck bring them from California, from Los Angeles to Baltimore. You know, costuming and and the fact that there are people who know so much about different periods and history and what the people must have worn. Right. You know, and they don't forget and put metal in this or zippers and that when they didn't hadn't invented the zipper yet. Yeah, right. Let's look at another movie. I'm going to we can take them at random except for the newest one which I want to lead to laughs. Okay. Cue me up. Well, why don't we do Prince Among Slaves next? There's no volume. Need volume. Must be having technical difficulties with that one. Well, while we're getting that queued up, I can tell you a little bit about the background of that one. Please. Um, oh, looks like he's got it. Okay, let's start from the beginning. There we go. Prince of Monk Slaves a 60-minute documentary tells the story of an African prince who was enslaved in Mississippi in the late 18th century. I was born Abdul Rahman. My father was Sori, king of Futajalon. Many years ago, on the west coast of Africa, I was saved by an African prince. You're saying my prince actually is an African prince. Al-Habib, 
They had a constitution. They had laws. This was a very sophisticated uh, society. Someone brought up into the jail and believes that on the day you're born, God knows and numbers every day of your life. And this fight, however cruel it seemed to him, it was part of a divine plan. It dawned on him that he is no longer a prince. He's no longer a warrior. From that point onwards, his dignity was based on his ability to uh, master the circumstances that he was in. Is, uh, is... Isabella. I want you to show her how we work the fields here in Mississippi. Yes, sir. And where did you learn to read Arabic? I learned as a boy in Timbo, in Timbuktu. Finally, through near providential circumstances, he negotiates his freedom with the ruler of the country that holds him captive. His royal status is recognized in the land that enslaved him. This was a man who has a lot of faith and he's committed to his principles, but he knows how to get what he wants from the system. In order to do that, he has to tell a story that makes sense to the people he's talking to. So we don't know how much of what he said was just for them and how much was what he really thought in his own heart, because he wasn't a fool. If you have faith, you will think that all of this happened for a reason, a reason that you, you don't know. But ultimately, things will get better. This biography is perhaps the best researched story of an enslaved African in American history, mm -hmm. and yet is largely unknown until now. Awesome. Yeah, that, that was a, that's one of my favorite films that we've ever worked on. You know, it, it, it came out of, um, just saying, where do some ideas come from? Yeah. Uh, this is going back 2000, I don't know, 2003, maybe. I was, uh, th th there was this book written, had just come out, and there was a great amount of press and discussion about it. It was about Lincoln's spiritual life, right? And it just suddenly struck me that, you know, something that we've never thought about, mm. at least I never thought about, was mm, me either. What, what was the spiritual life of the enslaved Africans, right? I mean, what, who were these people? What was their religious experience? How did they uh, understand religiously and spiritually the, what was going, you know, and I'm talking about before the, the you know, uh, the Africans adopted the Christian church, but before that, when they were enslaved initially from Africa. And in and, and learning about that a little bit, I learned, first of all, 20, 25% of all of the enslaved Africans were Muslim. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, we typically tell the story of African Americans beginning in slavery, like this beginning yeah. of hero, right? But here's the story of a man who was a, a prince of a country larger than the United States at the time, a man yeah. who was very well educated. He spoke several languages. So yeah. you know, the story of African Americans doesn't begin, in, begin at zero, begins at a very high place. You know? right. And so that was, what this, you know, that was really what we were trying to get across in that story. And really to tell that story, you know, and, and, you know, so many times, as you know, you know, African-Americans often say we're descendants of kings and queens of Africa. Well, that is actually true. Really true. Oh, yeah. It's really yeah. true. And this is an example of a guy's story. At the very end of the film, um, what happened in, in his real life was he uh, uh, he wasn't free. He was simply allowed because the president of the United States began to recognize after this man had been in the country for 40 years that he actually was African royalty. And mm -hmm. there were some political things going on. The United States president at that time, John Adams, was trying to curry favor with some Muslim countries. So he said, I'm going to let this guy go back. So he wasn't free, but he was allowed to go back. Well, um, our, our, our character had nine children, and he did not want to go back to Africa without his family. Exactly. So he, he spent about a year trying to raise enough money to purchase the freedom of his children. his children. And he was able to purchase the freedom of his wife and three of his children, but the other six he could not. Uh, Jackson, you know, the great <laughs> racist uh, President Andrew Jackson had become president in the meantime and was basically going to take him back into bondage. So he had to leave. He left with his wife and those three children only, mm -hmm. leaving the other six. So the film ends with a great family reunion between the African descendants 
and those had remained enslaved in America. It's very. Oh, I should I shouldn't tell the end before you get to it. Okay. It's very it's very. Yeah. Brutal. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, it it it, it, it just shows that it's it's true. You know, uh, that 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 the enslaved peoples uh, were the descendants of kings and queens. They truly were. But you know, this is both of these movies are historical. So yeah. you don't have to worry, well, I wouldn't, uh, about how they how are people going to perceive them three years from now. Right. You know, I mean. Right. Uh, and that's why we do historical films largely, for that reason. Yeah. yeah. Even, but even so, you know, you're still having to come up with a topic that is going to be, you know, again, connected with the zeitgeist in some way. Um, yeah. But, sure. but you're right. They stay evergreen. You know, Prince Among Slaves. Uh, was broadcast in 2004. Uh, it it was rebroadcast on PBS this past uh, February Black History Month. Say, say. So 80 percent of all PBS stations reran that program. Uh, you know, 16 years later. So yeah, there you go. So, hmm. Back to where'd you get the water and the ship from? If you tell me Baltimore Harbor, I'm going to jump out of my seat. Okay, Baltimore Harbor. <laughs> I don't see you jumping. That's because I'm a kid. I've been home too long. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, it's actually it, it's it's a um, it's a historical ship uh, that's that's usually in Baltimore uh, Harbor, and um, but it does it does sort of tours um, around uh, the country, and we we filmed that particular film in uh, St. Mary's, Maryland. Uh, which which has a you I know, know where that is yeah. sorry, like a, a, a ocean or an ocean but a bay and so the 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 boat actually was uh, was going to be coming in that area anyway so we just used it um, during that time and and it what was great about that is it's it's one of these ones where there's green actors involved with that so they were already had their costumes and they were all dressed up um, so that in itself is phenomenal and I do know St Mary's Bay. I used to take my kids down there because they have osprey. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's it's really, I mean, all of these various facets that have to come together to do TV productions and movies and documentaries. I know that there's some students listening. Where should they start? Well, you know, it's interesting you should ask that. We just had a, um, a webinar. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, for your audience, if you go to upf.tv, that's Unity Productions Foundation dot television TV, mm -hmm. uh, you're able to, by the way, stream any of our films that we're talking about. And also, since the COVID began, we've been doing uh, enrichment programs, in essence, webinars, uh, mm -hmm. knowing that people are cooped up, knowing that people need uh, mm -hmm. and not wanting to take three years to produce something. We've been doing these, you know, like we're doing now, like sort of these little mm -hmm. sort of webinars. And we just did one two days ago about how to get into the film business. Uh, we had a few um, uh, uh, documentary filmmakers and somebody who works on television programs, an editor, talking about their experiences. They're, but the bottom line, the real bottom line is, this is um, a career that that is really about um, doing rather than learning. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you, yeah. You, you can go to school for it, uh, uh, but. The, the, the real way of doing this job is to, is to begin working at it. And, and it's one of these jobs where you, you, even if you have the best education from the best school, you're going to start out at the bottom. That's just how it works. And, yeah. and you know, you just kind of work your way up uh, in, in whatever, and, you know, there's so many ways in which a person can participate in the film business. I mean, again, we're thinking about directors and camera people, but there's the people who create the costumes. I mean, you know, there's costume yeah. Seamstress. There's the people who do scene, the scene design, design the sets. There's people who work on props. There's people who work with animals. Um, in Prince Among Slaves, for example, uh, we had um, uh, a scene you, you see in the trailer where there's uh, old muskets being fired. Well, this was this is a guy who just owns, uh, you know, hundreds of different kinds of fake guns, guns from movies and shows, and he rents them out. Uh, so if you, ah! might, you might have a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, no, but I'm just saying that's great. So there's so many ways, you know, like if you stay at the end of a movie and you watch those credits, everybody yeah. 
you see, there did something, you know, and so there's so many ways of being part of uh, a film, not just making, not just lights, camera, action, but um, uh, composing the music, doing sound effects. I mean, I could go on and on. There's just, you know, it's a myriad of jobs. If you're really interested in film, you can do it. But there's also myriad, I'm just hearing cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Um, you know, as you're hiring people on, um, I, I was thinking about it when we got all those shutdown orders. Yeah. Oh, my God, what's happening to all the artists? What's happening to the actors and actresses? They're, they're in trouble. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the way the way the um, government support worked is um, if they could prove that um, they were, you know, they lost their job due to COVID, they mm -hmm. could fight unemployment. But if, like many gig workers, um, they were on their way to a job that just said, mm -hmm. okay, we, we can't start yet, they're not eligible. They're, they, 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 particularly the world of independent uh, film is really suffering. By the way, I saw a question come in on, on your little chat board, they're asking if we have internships or jobs uh, who want to pursue the career. Under normal years, we do. Uh, we don't anticipate having anything like that this year for obvious reasons that, in fact, we're, right. you can see we're working remotely. Uh, we do have yeah. a studio, but we're, we've not been in that studio for three months now and probably won't be for most of this year. So uh, if somebody is interested in, in an internship, check back with us in 2021, and hopefully things will have uh, cleared up by then. Yeah. Well, I want to go to, and it's not just because I know these three comedians who are individually hilarious together a riot mm. of their own. And look at Allah made me funny because it was kind of a departure from the historical, but a definite interfaith, inter-ethnic, inter-inter-inter thing. That's right. So can you cue me up? A law made me funny. You know, it's hard because you know, you're a terrorist. They see somebody who's me walking on the street, they hear a little voice in their head like, Rosanna! That's Osama Bilal. He's like the Muslim Tupac. They can't find this guy, but he releases a DVD every month and a half. The only thing worse than that is the moment I have to get on the plane. People are in shock. I mean, seriously, they're in the middle of conversations. Like, oh, where are you from? Where are you headed? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to die. <laughs> If we know the diagnosis, we can definitely medicate it. The medicine is olive oil. You got an ear infection? Olive oil! But like, mom, it's not really helping. We have to boil it, that's why. You know that Muslims don't get advertised? I would like to see one. Are you tired of eating pork? Are you sick of drinking alcohol? You only got one wife? Woo! <laughs> The United States is scared of two things, black people and Muslims. I got the best of both worlds. Olive oil? You have no shame. You have no shame. Of course, everybody's real nice to me once the plane safely lands. <laughs> I thought you were going to kill us. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Remember when he got up to go to the bathroom? I was going to stab you. I can't help it. Every time that video. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And I mean, you know, comedy today is vulgar. Mm. is profane mm. and not just you know to not just because it's about Muslims but because these three comedians can make you belly laugh yeah 
without being vulgar or profane. Yeah, no, no, they're they're great, and um, uh, you know, we we knew, you know, I'd seen their act uh, before this film. We really wanted to make sort of a concert film uh, mm -hmm. about them, uh, and also just their their journey to try to break into stand up. And, yeah, and this was our. Uh, by the way, a theatrical release, one of our, our theatrical releases, it did actually very well um, in theaters. And, um, uh, you know, it's a little dated. I mean, some of the humor has to do with George Bush and so forth. So, it, you know. Same it, difference. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. Different, different color skin, same difference. Yeah. I want to move, lastly, to your move into animation. Right. So can you cue me up and then we'll come back and talk about it? The um, it's going to be an is it an it's an animated film? It's an animated film. That's right. Not a documentary. The world is full of signs that we often do not see. Okay, I hope we've whetted a lot of appetite with that little piece now. Hurry up and finish. Anyway, tell me about the move into animation. Yeah, so um, so this film comes out of, um, <laughs> again, you know, we're talking about thinking about the, what an audience may care about. Um, so a few years ago, three, four years ago, uh, when we were finishing up uh, The Sultan and the Saint, we're looking for our next project. And... Big in the news at that time was the Syrian refugee crisis. Of course, that terrible humanitarian disaster is still going on today. Exactly. exactly. Um, and we wanted to do something about that, but you know what? I wasn't sure what we could do. In the meantime, another whole track uh, we were pursuing and, and thinking was doing some kind of film on Rumi. Rumi is uh, the best-selling poet in America that no one knows is Muslim, right? And yeah. so we, a story about Rumi would be good. But again weren't sure how we would go about that. Well, uh, as those two separate ideas were kind of bouncing around, I came across an article about a group of Syrian refugees living in Europe somewhere, some terrible refugee camp in Europe, where they had created a makeshift library. They had brought books with them from their homes. Mm -hmm. And they were doing reading groups. And one of the people they were reading was Rumi. Mm -hmm. Now, I know enough about Rumi. You know, I've gone to weddings where his love poetry is mm -hmm. uh, uh, read. And I thought, well, what on earth could these refugees find in Rumi. And, mm. and did a little research and found out that Rumi was also a refugee. When, yeah. he was, when he was a boy, he was fleeing the Mongols. And for seven years, he was a displaced person. Uh, and then, and, and then, so this idea came that, you know, maybe um, uh, he was writing for these same refugees out of his mm. experience. And so that began the idea and immediately was sort of a fantasy idea, you know, that, uh, so this one thing led to another, and you know we just had this vision of this uh, young twelve-year-old girl named Lamia, and and her name's Lamia because one of the first in doing the research, I was talking to some refugee Syrian refugee children, and the first person I spoke to was a girl named Lamia, and so it kind of stayed with me. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's a twelve-year-old um, girl fleeing mm -hmm. the violence of her country. She's mm -hmm. given a book of poetry, of Rumi's poetry, that becomes a magical gateway where she can meet the young Rumi. When he was a boy fleeing the violence of his time and, uh, and, and together in sort of a, a dream world, she helps him write the poem that 800 years later saves her life. So it's animation because it's a fantasy. It's not a documentary. It's a, it's a narrative film. It's got a strong fantasy element and that lends itself to animation. Now, it's animation, not children's animation. This is adult oriented animation. This would be for families and adults. Um, uh, kind of program. Again, this, this the subject is serious, but it has a despite uh, it, its difficult storyline, it does have a happy ending at the uh, finally. Okay, well, leave me hanging, won't you? Right. Let me say that 
this has been the fastest 50 minutes, and I'll call you later. Oh. Um, I, I mean, it's just amazing. And um, you know what I would like to ask you to do? Sure. You know you can uh, ask me anything. Huh? You know you can ask me anything, and I'll be happy. I know, but I'm not going to shoe shop in this time. Okay. What I want is movie review. Okay. You know, one of the things that has come up is uh, all of us being shut in. We've been forced to, what is it, Amazon Prime, Hulu, Netflix. Right. And some, we're not able to even tell the difference, but something is happening behind the scenes. Yeah. Because some are carrying one kind of thing. Others are carrying another kind of thing. Yeah. And I want to know, are there pushing PBS and some of the things I love out. But I will save that for next time. All right. This is Amina Aldean with Critical Talk with Alex Cronomer. And I want to thank you and I will talk to you shortly. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Take Heather. care. Bye. Bye-bye.